meeting here. We're going to start with Charlie and work our way down the table this way. Charlie? Can you hear me? Yes. So I'd like to begin with a confession to David Gibson about for whom I voted for president. I wrote in my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> was not Donald Trump. I couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton because of what, in my view, are horrific views on abortion, uh, which, in my view, is our social justice and civil rights issue of our time. I couldn't vote for Donald Trump for many more reasons, but I was told I only had five to seven minutes, so I'm going to leave it to others to enumerate those. I'm not going to take up my time with that. Plus, in New Jersey, where I live, it's a deep blue state, and so my vote for president really didn't matter that much anyway. I voted for my father-in-law so I could at least earn some social capital with my wife. <laughs> I think the election of Donald Trump has the potential to be one of the worst events in the history of the republic. But I also think, indirectly, it has the potential to be one of the best. Let me explain. Our American political binary has always been deeply unstable as we attempt to shove complex electorates into either this side or the other side. Rather than fight for solid and consistent principles over time, the parties simply work to build as broad a coalition as possible by whatever means possible, and this often results in near total incoherence. Republicans like to talk about themselves as the party of Lincoln. Have you heard this one? But that party was an upstart liberal party, which, in the interest of social justice for the most vulnerable, overrode the plain original intent of the Constitution. <clears throat> Today, Republicans are, at least in theory, a conservative party, deeply skeptical of social justice, and will defend the original intent of the Constitution to the death. Meanwhile, Democrats like to think of themselves as a party of energetic social justice. And uh, because they tend to favor the powerful, um, those who... Uh, appoint freedom, autonomy, and choice first place, they hurt the weak, and the Democrats stand against that. Of course, this is true on many issues, except for abortion, where they basically have a libertarian approach, appealing to freedom, autonomy, and choice as the overriding values. And of course, the abortion policies Democrats support, no doubt, favor those with power, men and women who have freedom, autonomy, and choice, and completely abandon the most vulnerable population we can imagine, prenatal children population, Pope Francis has said, have the face of the Lord as the least among us. If our checks and balances can keep Trump from doing a lot of damage his next four years, <coughs> I must admit I have some questions about that, I think his election actually does have the capacity to finally blow up our deeply unstable political binary. And for three reasons. First, Trump himself is neither a Democrat or a Republican. He demonstrates that one need not fit traditional categories to run for and win the presidency. That's an important thing to establish. Second, the dissatisfaction with both major, major parties has been substantial for some time, but is now reaching a crescendo. 43% of the country now refuses to ID with either party, the highest number in the history of the poll. This includes over 50% of young people. There is little doubt these numbers will go even higher after the election. The narrative, which I think there's some basis for is that the GOP has sold out to Trump and continues to. The Democrats are rigging the system against Bernie Sanders, or they did, and um, that's caused a lot of problems for lots of people. Matthew Dowd, you may know, is the chief political analyst for ABC News. I did an interview with him recently where he said, quote, we need to start with that entrepreneurial spirit of the founders and create a new political movement of independence, separate from the current political duopoly Based on common sense, accountability, and compassion, this movement is coming, and I think in 2018 we will see many folks running this independence locally across the country, end quote. Third, there's radical dissatisfaction with the big media. I think their approval rating is about 14% last time I checked. And their being so powerfully wrong about this past election cycle, I think may cause them to actually challenge fundamentally the way they do things. Just today, Pope Francis said that the media need to guard against, quote, the disease is coprophilia. Have you heard about this? It's apparently something like constantly looking to communicate scandal or communicate ugly things, end quote. Sure, the philosophy of it bleeds, it leads, makes corporate media shareholders happy. It gets page views, it gets ratings. But the binary divisions which make them so much money pitting white against black, rich against poor, white against non-white, 
liberals against conservatives, religion against secular, etc., are literally tearing the country apart. I think they will be forced, however, to do some more real reporting on the stories of actual people. I don't know if you saw Van Jones on CNN last night. It was an extraordinary um, hour-long segment on the messy truth. I think that was wonderful. This, these messy truth stories which reveal that the American electorate is far more diverse and interesting than the categories we currently use are able to reveal. So my final point is then, what does religion have to do with this? Well, for religious people who are committed to the claim that all human beings are brothers and sisters, who are committed to the view that what unites us is far more important than what divides us, who are committed to the moral traditions which are complex and go beyond this side versus that side, who are committed to intellectual debate and the marshalling of evidence and argument rather than the politics of power and destruction of one's purported enemies, I believe this is our moment. This is our time to shine. To resist the idolatry of our secular political categories and assumptions, the time is now. In the remarks which Pope Francis called out, in the same remarks which Pope Francis used to call out the media today, he said, religion is love, unity, respect, and dialogue. This is my, that's a quote, religion is love, unity, respect, and dialogue. This is my main message of hope for this evening. We have a golden opportunity to raise a religious voice in our culture which replaces idolatry of secular politics, secular political parties, the us versus them culture war, and above all of money, which is driving all of this, with love, unity, respect, and dialogue. Thank you. to be here. I um, always remember uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, walking home from school with a, with a good friend of mine who came from a very a pious Catholic family, and, and um, I asked him, since it seemed like, you know, I had a question, and he could answer it. I said, well, so could you um, explain the Trinity to me? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't miss a beat, and chat back. It's a mystery. <laughs> and I spent more time trying to unravel the mystery of uh, Catholicism than I, I care to think. But, um, but I'm delighted to be here. I, I decided since I was going to be in Greenwich, I would look up the vote for president um, and compare it to the vote four years ago. And interestingly, um, in, in 2012, uh, People in Greenwich voted for Mitt Romney over Barack Obama by 16,500 votes, roughly, to, to 13,000. Um, and this year, voted uh, for uh, Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump by 16,250 votes uh, to roughly 11,000 for Donald Trump. Which leads me to suspect that probably two out of five people here, assuming a representative sample, which is uh, voted for Donald Trump, and I, and I hope that that's the case. Um, I see a hand back there, so that's at least one. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but it does tell us a lot about, uh, and if you, look at, if you look at the town by town map, which you can do if you Google it and see the New York Times printed it of, of, of Connecticut, um, the vote for Hillary Clinton uh, came from traditionally Republican areas like this, and in, in the area where I live in Hartford, Avon, Simsbury, Farmington, all voted for, for Clinton, uh, West Hartford, um, and, and the um, people of color in, in, the, uh, in the main cities, in Hartford, New Haven, and Norwich, and, and, uh, and, and yet, uh, and in the, in the rural parts of the, of the of the state, it was Trump, but mm -hmm. through the, up through the Naugatuck Valley and in eastern Connecticut, white working class. And, and that picture, which, um, which is the picture that the, that the news media have been painting, it's been, you know, perhaps a bit more black and white than it should be, um, but, uh, but I'm going to push back a little bit against Charlie's view that the media got it totally wrong. Um, the media missed, that is to say, the, the predictors that the media, that, that reporters quote, uh, got the overall results of the, of the election wrong, but we now know that Hillary Clinton won, uh, getting on towards three million more votes than, than Donald Trump. Um, not in the right states, of course, from her standpoint. Um, but uh, but the overall picture, at, including the picture of of, a, of an unhappy 
angry perhaps, um, uh, anti-establishment, white working class uh, embracing Donald Trump and, or at least his message, um, which which we which we knew on the eve of the election and had read about quite a lot was was right. Um, again, not as nuanced as we would like, and and. Uh, all of those people are not deplorable, uh, and many of them don't agree with many parts of, of the total Trump picture, but it's important uh, to bear that in mind, and I think uh, Van Jones's kinds of, of, of lessons about this are, are important for us uh, to take um, to heart. Um, having said that, uh, you know, the normal thing to do at a panel like this, and I expect it was sort of in Tom Gallagher's mind when he set it up, uh, was that we should talk now about trying to figure out a way to get the country together behind the new president and give him or her uh, a chance to do what uh, needs to be done. Um, there's actually a fair amount of evidence on the table that the person, however, that we elected president this time is a dangerous person. Um, he is something of a bully. Uh, he has shown uh, little knowledge uh, and not really much respect for the Constitution, uh, including separation of powers. Um, he seems uh, willing to uh, be a bull in the, in the foreign policy uh, shop, uh, China shop. Um, he's given to uh, conspiracy theories, assertions of things that aren't true, and so on. We all know those stories. Uh, and that's to say nothing of uh, potential or real <laughs> conflict of interest stories in terms of his, his financial interests. I don't think I'm saying anything that, they, that couldn't be said, uh, except I see a thumb down, which, which is perhaps disagreement. I'll take it that way, uh, to the lions uh, with me. Um, but I'm an opinion writer, and I get to do this. Uh, David Gibson has no opinions, and therefore he doesn't. <laughs> but they pay me to have opinions, and so I'm taking it, uh, taking the liberty. Um, now, I am not suggesting by enumerating all of those things, thumbs down or thumbs up, uh, that um, that the job for everybody else in the country who had is to get together against every thing that, that a Trump administration could do, say, propose, or otherwise. Um, uh, however, um, it seems to me that there is a danger uh, um, of feeling, particularly if your particular agenda uh, includes aspects um, of what the Trump or Republican platforms propose of thinking that you could get yours and hold the line on everything you disapprove of. Um, there's a history of this kind of thing, and it's not particularly pretty. Uh, and, and in this group, I will, I will call attention uh, to one of the things that happened uh, now getting on towards almost a century ago in 1933, uh, when the, the Catholic Party in Germany, the, which was known as the Center Party, um, decided to support the Enabling Act uh, that gave Hitler and his cabinet all power to do whatever they wanted. Um, and the reason was uh, that the chairman of the Center Party, uh, who was a Catholic priest, in fact, named Ludwig Kass, um, agreed to support uh, this act of power um, by, uh, in exchange for assurances of the party's continued existence, uh, the protection of Catholic civil liberties and religious liberties, um, protection of religious schools, and retention of civil servants that happened to be members of the Senate party. Um, it didn't work out that well. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a cautionary tale. I'm not saying that Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler, but if you think you can get a piece of this without getting the full package, you should think again, it seems to me. And that uh, ought to be a cautionary lesson uh, for the, for the uh, Catholic Bishops' Conference, I think, um, perhaps for some evangelicals, um, and so on. Uh, it may be also a cautionary tale for people in the business community who think that they can get uh, a good deal with tax breaks and deregulation of, say, financial services. Um, but um, are not so happy with other aspects of it. 
Um, this, these are judgment calls, and the question is, what are you prepared uh, to compromise on in order to get your uh, piece of the action? No doubt, as we go forward, uh, there will be the usual debates about issues that we're familiar with, uh, ones that are on the table, the Affordable Care Act, uh, now uh, Medicare. Um, looks to me like there may be a few people here who are actually you know, receiving Medicare. Um, but of course, you will be grandfathered or grandmothered in, uh, and so you don't have to worry about it. But if we're worried about um, what will be the case when our children are our age, uh, perhaps we should think about that. Uh, there's Dodd-Frank, of course. All of these are normal issues, um, and, uh, and that really goes for Supreme Court appointments and the future of um, uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, whether, whether the country will continue uh, to have abortion um, as a constitutional right. These, are, these have been normal issues in the country for a long time uh, and may continue to be. Um, the one issue that I would want to signal here as not a normal issue uh, and one that can't wait uh, is, is, is global warming, is the Earth. Um, we had yesterday the example of Al Gore going to meet with Ivanka Trump, the, uh, Trump, the, uh, ex, the president-elect's daughter, uh, coming away with some positive things to say. On the other hand, um, we also we had the news today uh, that, uh, that that the next president, or the next uh, head of the of the Environmental Protection Agency, is to be Scott Pruitt, uh, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma, who has been the biggest thorn in the side of the Environmental Protection Agency, a huge supporter of of fossil fuels, um, and. It seems to me that if we are talking about the common good here, um, we cannot hold back on this issue. Um, it does seem to me to be the existential issue. I, I, I think, uh, as, as I said at dinner, uh, I am, you know, uh, I confess in, 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 the, in these, these halls, uh, uh, you know, a traditional liberal uh, pro-choice but I would give the whole thing up in a heartbeat if I thought, uh, in exchange, if I could, in exchange for a real um, serious effort to deal uh, with global warming. I think that is the existential issue for everybody on Earth. There is no moral universe unless we deal with this. Um, and I'm afraid that uh, I mean, I'm happy to say that I think I think Pope Francis recognizes this. His encyclical Laudato Si is, uh, is is a really been a clarion call um, for the world, uh, but it hasn't been heard very clearly uh, by um, the Catholic bishops in the United States. And so I think if we're going to come together for the common good, that's the issue. And I'll end on that. Mark. Hello, all. I uh, sit with the dying at Danbury Hospital in a volunteer program known as No One Dies Alone. And I was up there recently with a darling older woman named Evelyn. And Evelyn looked like an angel. The bed was all white, her pillow was white, her hair was white, and someone had put just a little bit of pink rouge on her cheeks. So I said, you know, a couple, our fathers, how Mary, threw in an act of contrition for good measure. And I sat and held her soft little hand. And a couple hours later, Evelyn died, a peaceful death. And when I left the hospital, I started to think about what was important. Because the things I thought were important when I went in the hospital had diminished in importance. The ding on the side of my car, politics, 
and the fact that my rescue dog will not listen to me. <laughs> but what does matter? God, love, friends, family, and the truth. The truth still matters. Now, I cannot be so hubris as to say that I know what the truth is. I will leave that to, to the philosophers. I will also not be so hubris as to tell you what Donald Trump's next move will be. But that's a whole other story. We can look at one small aspect of the truth, and that's called the confirmation bias. It's a human condition. We all suffer from it. We like to hear and see information <laughs> that confirms what we already believe. And we like to discount or ignore that which doesn't fit in with our worldview. Now this confirmation bias can lead smart people to make dumb investments. <laughs> it can lead NASA to launch a shuttle that blows up 73 seconds after liftoff. And it can lead both sides of the political aisle from watching news or seeking information that doesn't make them comfortable or they don't agree with. I think we had a couple people leave the room already, and I'm sorry they did, because they missed out. They're not even going to get to hear Tom. <laughs> um, so what can we do about our confirmation bias? Well, one, we can acknowledge it. It's part of the human condition. <clears throat> Two, we can search for evidence. And three, like Pope Francis said, we can have dialogue instead of debate. So acknowledging our confirmation bias, all you have to do is watch a football game. The ref makes a call, goes for your team, great call. <laughs> right? Goes for the other team. Ah, that was a horrible call. Right? So it's there. So we have to look for evidence. Now, looking at one side of an issue and not the other is like crossing the street and only looking to the left and to the right. You with me here? We can be blindsided and terrible things can happen. Researcher Pamela Myers says we are in a post-truth society. And she said this before the election. With the proliferation of fake news and social media, it's only gotten worse. Is Donald Trump going to uh, forbid gays from being on television? Did you hear that one? No, of course not. Is our poor beloved Charlie Brown a racist? No, that's so mean. <laughs> and did the Sandy Hook school shooting really happen? Yes. Six minutes and 26 people later, it did. So before we retweet and repeat, we need to look for evidence. And we need to teach our kids to look for evidence. We also need to teach our kids to engage in dialogue instead of debate. When we debate, we have this side and this side. Like being in a boxing ring. I'm right, I'm right. You're wrong, you're wrong. When we have dialogue, we communicate. We listen with open hearts and open minds, and we search for common ground. So instead of being like this and like this, we find common ground and we make progress. It's helpful to use empathy here. 
maybe a little bit of a sense of humor. I had one of my students was born and raised in Connecticut, and he happens to be a Muslim, and he happens to wear a long white robe over his street clothes. And he told me, you know, Professor, every few weeks somebody yells out their car window, go home. And I'm like, dude, I am home. <laughs> right? <coughs> and I say, well, Iktar, doesn't that make you angry? And he said, Professor, I just feel sorry for them. Now, if he can do that, we can do much more. We're all different, but isn't different one of the things that really makes America great? One thing that we can all agree on is that we're all going to die. We're going to kick the bucket. We're going to vote our last vote, just like Evelyn. And when we're looking back on our lives, do we want to see ourselves as the ones who looked for evidence, who engaged in dialogue, who were the good listeners, who were empathetic and had a great sense of humor? Since you're all here tonight, I think you're going to look back on your lives and you're going to like what you see. And I really, really hope so. And that, my friends, is the truth. I think one of the things that um, about our world today is that we don't know how to deal with the noise. You know, there's people sort of around my age and maybe around older in this room. And um, we live in so much noise. It's so loud. All the stuff that comes our way and comes our way and comes our way. We are not biologically created to deal with all this noise. It may be that the younger people can and will, I don't know. But I think that it, it's important to consider, in the midst of all these conversations, what does all that mean? And what role did noise play in the election that just took place? I don't know the answer, but it would be, I think it would be crazy to not consider that when you consider where we are, what's going on, what's going on in the world. I took a train this summer from Penn Station to Portland, Oregon. I drove back on a motorcycle. I drive a lot. I drove to Alabama recently and back. I drove to back from uh, Missouri home. I, I try to go on the blue roads, the blue highways. Um, I love America, and I love Americans. I think most everyone I meet is nice. I think most everyone I meet is optimistic. We got all gripes, people gripe. But I think most people are optimistic. Um, I am not a fan of Michael Moore. However, I thought Michael Moore's analysis of the election before the election and Michael Moore's analysis after the election was incredibly accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think North. I think we Northeasterners know about the least of the people I've observed about what our country is all about. We live in our bubble here. Um, I don't say that to be offensive in any way, but we are we we are the center of the noise. The noise comes from you know twenty miles that way, um, and we miss things a lot. We miss things a lot. I was surprised by the results of the election. I am not pessimistic about the results of the election. I am, there's evidence right here, right now, we're all talking to each other. It's happening right now, I haven't done this after any election. People are talking about real things. I've had so many real conversations. And it's so ironic in, in, the, in, the, in the era of communication, we all turned into sheep. We all copied each other. And, kind of bs each other for 15 straight years. That's my observation. I feel like we just put a crust of 
You know, try to name the liberal accomplishments of Bill Clinton. It's hard. Try to name the what you would think of as conservative accomplish, accomplishments of Bill Clinton. Welfare reform, defense of marriage act, capital gains rates, Glass-Steagall. I'm, I'm mentioning all this because Hillary Clinton won the conservative place. You know, in theory, that's what those numbers seem to suggest. So I, I, I don't even know, like when people said, well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump, he's a conservative, I, mean, I thought more conservative than Hillary Clinton, what does that mean? I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. I mean it literally, I don't know exactly what we're talking about. Supreme Court justices, that was the one thing, like, oh, the Supreme Court justices, okay, okay. it seems that Donald Trump prefers more conservative ones, and Hillary seems to prefer more liberal ones. We look for the things on earth that matter the most, and we have to work really hard to do it. That's our method. Our method is hard work. It's harder, I think, than ever to do that. What actually matters? And then how do you actually figure out and understand what that thing is? What I would say is my observation about where I'm 50, I, I kind of knew what was going on for, let's say, 37 years or so, right? So when, let's say, Jimmy Carter was president, the first president, the first presidential election, presidential election I could participate in was Ronald Reagan. Um, this has been the, the era of the most substantive set of conversations that I have observed in my lifetime. I know our president, our soon-to-be president, was a reality show guy. Whatever you want to call him, he's a businessman. I know people's brains are polluted with all the crap that comes in more and more and more. But I also know that in the last six months or so, the number of conversations that people tend to have about what matters more, do we let Muslims into the country or not, and what does that mean? What, does, does that rank higher than the notion of a democracy, lower than the concept of taxation? Like, where does all that fit? Where does truth, what is the role of the media? What should the media do? When should they do it? How should they do it? I've heard all those kinds of conversations in the last little bit, and I think it's really helpful. And I think when we look at things on paper, when we look at things on paper, they seem obvious, but it never goes that way. I've seen a million business plans in my life. The one thing you know when you see a business plan is that's not how it's gonna go. <laughs> it never goes that way. Well, whatever we think, we don't know how this is gonna go. You don't know, we can't psychoanalyze Donald Trump and say that's what's gonna happen. Or if Hillary had been elected, that's what would have happened. It never goes that way. I think there's a good sign right now, which is that we're doing this. And to me, it makes me very hopeful. So, thanks. Amen to that, Tom. Thank you. Just having these conversations, and again, props to the parish and to all of you for having this series of, of, of conversations, which I know is going to be ongoing. But it is so important to have these, and I hope there are people of different views here and people who generally did vote different ways and you'll all stay and that you'll all contribute to this. Um, they're going to be passing around. Any questions? Yeah, good. Okay. I just want to throw out a couple of questions here. And I, your interventions were all terrific, very honest, forthright, moving. But my question is, is again, it's all very well and good and we're all here as intentional people I suspect seeking the common ground, even if we disagree on it. Is there really common ground out there? You know, this election, you know, and, and this current moment we're living in showed us to be so polarized and so divided. And all the, you know, it's not dialogue, Marianne, as you talked, we need that. But is there, is there even any commonly accepted values, mores, policy? that we can dialogue over, that we can agree on. Does the common ground exist? Any of you? <laughs> All right. well, I have one thing, one small bee in my bonnet, so, which is, which Go is, ahead, uh, you got a bee. I'm, 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 you know, notoriously uh, unpleasant person. But, um, 
I think you know another way of framing your question gets at at what Mary Ann was saying and what I would wanted to sort of push at which is how do you have dialogue when you can't agree on the facts and if you're equally committed if you're equally committed to determining what is the case as you are to dialogue then you may find yourself in a kind of impossible situation in other words I I want to sit down and have a dialogue with somebody who's a climate change denier where do I start and and so I'm gonna throw this over to you where do I start we're looking for suggestions from the audience can I try one thought there which is in my work so the Nantucket project there's a guy named Richard Saul Orman who was the creator of the TED conference he is a interesting guy 50% of the time I want to smack him 50% of the time I want to hug him but deep down I think he's a really good person and among the most profound things I ever heard him say was that almost everything you think you know now is likely wrong if you can kind of walk at life that way we are gonna be okay and I just want to add that means I'm in that like I'm probably wrong so now I have a basis for conversation one thing I like to say that's different I don't what's different about the Nantucket project and Ted there's a lot of things about them but I don't like to knock another organization but I'm going to they know we don't not knowing is okay it's okay not to know and I don't think that when we get into conversations about the facts that we're actually often dealing with exactly what those things are I'm not saying you're wrong about this or that but I am saying if you want to have a conversation with somebody maybe you start by saying let's assume we both are wrong so boy oh boy if we could ever get to the point where we could have an argument about the facts and people were interested in the facts and debating the facts that would be a thousand times better than what currently happens which is sort of maneuvering yourself for political power reasons and trying to push your opponent out of the discussion so and I with all due respect to even the word the phrase climate denier seems to me an example of that it's a it's an attempt to push someone out of the discussion as not really serious they don't understand I accept climate change because of my understanding of the facts but there are many who don't who think they have the facts on their side Mark Stein is a conservative columnist who just edited a book called climate change the facts and he's someone who denies climate change he would love a chance to debate the facts I wish we would have public debates these debates we have every presidential cycle get huge ratings they got one twelfth of the ratings let's have Mark Stein and Mark Silk go at it on climate change on you know CBS and let's make a million dollars let's have a debate on the facts of climate change I don't think that I mean I don't think that would get us anywhere and 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 partly because I'm not the world's great expert although my son Ezra is but but I think a forensic approach which is really what you're calling for debates between essentially professional debaters over an issue as complex as as climate change simply lead to confirmation bias that is people will listen to that debate and come away and say well I'm with Stein or I'm with Silk these are not questions I mean at some point a subject like climate change is not a matter of having you know two people with opposite opinions debate it is a matter of making public policy on the basis of scientific consensus which in this case is overwhelming and we have created a polity which has been so far unable to do that 
um, for various reasons, including the economic interests of the fossil fuel industry. And I don't think, with all due respect, really, um, on most issues, you know, I'm for open discussion, debate, uh, letting, um, you know, taking a position that, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to dial back my sense of certainty and, and, and say that I don't know enough. Um, but if the vast majority of climate scientists are right, and the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is increasing at the rate that it is, and the heat of the earth is increasing at the rate that it is, we simply don't have the time. And I don't think discussions are going to get us there. Now, maybe nothing will get us there, and that will be that. But you've got now the Senate Appropriations Committee last spring, which is to say a majority of Republicans voted, there's no budget, but voted for budget for the Department of Energy to study a geoengineering plan to deflect the rays of the sun from the earth in order to lower, lower the climate. That was voted now. There's no budget, so it's not in the budget. But that was what a panel, the Appropriations Committee of the United States Senate, voted because there's enough concern about the people who actually make these decisions to think, well, we should throw enough crap into the atmosphere to block out sunlight because of what's happening. I don't think this is that kind of an issue where we can simply sit around and talk. I don't have an answer, but I, but I have to dissent from the idea that we can dialogue our way out of this over a period of decades. The, let's leave facts aside. What the heck? Um, you know, one thing I think we can all agree on is that one of the um, blessings of this election is that it made Saturday Night Live relevant <laughs> and good in some, in some respects, not, although not to Mr. Trump's view necessarily. But one of the most um, you know, provocative and insightful pieces of social and political commentary was the skit, the Black Jeopardy skit. I don't know if anybody saw it. And again, provocative, but you know, it's, they have this recurring theme of, of black people playing Jeopardy, and they're typical, you know, that the, all these questions and or answers, and then questions that white people won't get. And they had it was when Tom Hanks guest hosted, and he played, he came on, and he played the uh, kind of goatee old, you know, uh, red pickup red. truck driving redneck <laughs> guy, and they were kind of laughing. It's like, oh, you're not going to get any of these questions, right? And of course he did. And the whole point of the thing, I won't explain it, you go Google it afterwards, it's great, is that the black people, contestants on the show, and the white guy had all of the same concerns and the same issues. They were all economically shafted, and they were all out of the process, they were all <coughs> disempowered, and they disagreed completely. Yeah. So much of this, again, you can talk about the facts, and I wish we would, and I think that's great, but so much of this, it strikes me, is we've got people who have the same concerns and are, and, and are in their own silos or are, are voting, say, there's nobody else you can vote for except Hillary Clinton. And the other ones say, no, no, there's nobody else you can vote for except Donald Trump. You know, this is faith and the common good. Is this a question of facts or is it a question of conversion of us coming to some, is this going to be a, cha a, a national change of heart? Is this a religious discussion, or is it purely a policy discussion? Tell me. <laughs> Very simply, it's a human discussion. This is a discussion about our being human and us having more in common simply because we're humans. We have different perceptions, different circles of friends, but we need to we need to discuss what's important to humanity, to our kids, for our future. Not just Connecticut, not just our nation. We have to look beyond that and not just our generation. And we need to model this 
for our children and we need to see the glass half full one of the challenges it seems to me is to affirm so many of the things that are driving concerns today racial justice being one of them one of the primary ones and still being able to highlight what David mentioned, which is common concerns. And I think too often in our zeal, or in certain people's zeal, to affirm the great evil of racial injustice and discrimination against vulnerable populations, we tend to isolate them and pit them against other populations, often in a binary, us versus them. And so that common ground gets lost precisely because it's been set up in a way that makes it almost impossible to find. In fact, the binary often requires there to be no common ground so that this can happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to affirm with all that I am the real serious attempts to have justice for marginalized populations and focus on that period full stop. But if we can do that in a way that doesn't pit us against each other and makes it possible for us to understand what went down in that Jeopardy skit, I want to second David's point. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Um, that's that's a tension-filled process, but I think we need to affirm both. I want to get to some questions here, a, a bunch of great questions coming in here, and I, I hope to do justice to as many of them as I possibly can. Let me just start out with uh, one that seems very apropos. Um, how do we get to the truth, given that the media gives sound bites and tweets and sometimes false news? Uh, I'm on Twitter, so guilty as charged. Um, hopefully, it's it's fairly true. But again, um, this you know, there's also an issue of communication. Who's getting what? What kind of information they're getting? Uh, it was a remarkable campaign. I mean, uh, Trump spent hardly anything compared to, to Hillary Clinton. She ran the traditional campaign, spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and he won the election by tweeting out various. Uh, pithy sayings at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, you know, how, in this media environment, how do we get to the truth? How do people ascertain that? Uh, I think probably the, the, the correct answer to that is that it depends on what the subject is. Um, everyone here is an expert on things having to do with their own personal life. Um, and there are people that you trust. And uh, there are sources in your own community uh, who you believe. And then there are others who you don't. Um, and on a range of subjects, you can feel fairly confident that you know what's going on. Um, on other things, we depend on news sources, on all kinds of things. Whatever floats into a Facebook page, uh, we think we know. Uh, and some of those subjects are factual matters of, uh, you know, what Kim Kardashian is doing, and those are subject to empirical verification or not. Um, pretty simple, if one can get a decent source, if one can recognize it. Others are very complicated. Um, is the Iran nuclear deal the worst deal in the history of diplomacy, uh, or is it something sensible? How do we come to a judgment like that? Those are questions you know, if you care about the Iran deal, and it may be, you know, a small thing in your horizon of things that you need to know about, um, you depend on uh, whatever it is that happens to come across either your Facebook feed or because you watch the nightly news or whatever. If you want to know more about it, uh, you actually have access at your fingertips and your underwear in your basement in front of your <laughs> computer screen to a lot of pretty good information. You may have to sift through it. Um, but there is no simple way uh, to answer the question other than to talk about, you know, what are the things that we want to know about? You know, I, this is going to be, you'll see this is sort of a theme with me, but um, if you're in media right now, you're scared. If you're the editor of the New York Times right now, you're scared. If you're the editor of the Daily Beast right now, you're scared. And if you're scared because your business is diminishing, you know, I met with an, an editor of a big, I won't say who or what, but, and, the, and I'm meeting with them, and the whole meeting was a business meeting. And I left the business meeting thinking, 10 years ago, this guy wouldn't even have been in that meeting. 
He would have just been doing his journalistic work. But media is falling apart. You know, you want to win, where do you get your crack cocaine? You get it through clicks and reads and things. How do you get them? Drama. What does drama ask you to do? Lie. Little tiny lies, one by one by one. It's happening. We're in it right now. So I've heard this a lot. Where do we find truth? Um, humanity. I, I steal this from a guy named Matt Ridley, The Rational Optimist. It's a book I really like. Man looks forward in doom. That's what we do. We are screwed. Nuclear war is going to screw us. China syndrome has us. Uh, population, we're done. Ice age, we're, we're screwed. We're done on that one. Uh, Communism is going to take us down. You know, we've heard all these things. We've seen in all these moments. We always look back in awe, though. We look back and say, whoa, look at what we can do. We made this thing and that thing and this society and that society. We are amazing. Well, the answers come, and they come because we're good at this. Humans are good at solving these problems, and we're especially good at solving problems that people want answers to. Someone's coming with these solutions. Our society is coming with these solutions, in part because we want them. We're having a conversation about it right now. And I, I don't want to make light of facts, because facts matter. If it is true that the environment is being destroyed by our actions, I will bet you we will do something about it, in part because we're talking about it right now. Even if we disagree on a fact, I bet if you ask most people, would you like a cleaner environment or a less clean environment, they're going to say they want a cleaner environment. Right? That's just the way humans tend to be. Doesn't mean we're not going to fight about it, we're not going to fight about how to pay for it. But right now, there are, there are solar sources of energy that cost less on a kilowatt hour basis than many forms of fossil fuels. Right now. And you want to know why they exist? Because this problem's been going on for a while. These questions, no matter what side you fall on, People have been investing in it and studying in it and thinking about it and how to put it up. And if you think when Elon Musk announced those tiles a few months ago, that was just some kind of sideshow joke, I'll bet you you're wrong. I'll bet you you are wrong. So I just have faith that in these moments, in free societies like ours, we solve these problems a lot. And my mother-in-law, who survived five years in a Nazi ghetto, looks at our problems and says, this is nothing. This is nothing. So, I think the answers to your truth, they actually do exist. You do have to work harder. That you have to do. If you see some wacko brand on your article, move on to the next one. If, if you don't know that brand, don't trust it. It's probably wrong. Ask a friend. Ask around. I, I accept that we have to work harder, but I also have great confidence that you can trust your instincts on these things, and I think you can find answers to these things. And this is, I really do believe, this is temporary. There's going to be certification methods and, and fact-checking methods and things that will happen. You know, why do you think Howard, this is my prediction, why did Howard Schultz just step down at, at Starbucks? I'll bet you he runs for president next time. I'll bet you he runs for president next time as a Democrat. I bet he does it because Donald Trump just did it. That's why. Why Now, oh, you can be a businessman and win a presidency. Someone just proved it. Right? So is it all bad? Like, you know, you know these stories. Is it all bad when these things happen? By the way, I'm not making a comment on Donald Trump one way or another. But rational optimism is real, you know. Anyway. Um, sort of related to that, um, uh, was another good question. Um, and I'll quote it here. This isn't me. As a father of two college students, I'm the father of an 11-year-old. I'll be lucky if I can pay for her to college. When she's <laughs> As father of two college students, what are we teaching our kids when our universities are not teaching coping mechanisms and are instead coddling students whose candidate didn't win? They had, by the way, this was not the most contentious election ever. Look at Adams Jefferson. Good at point. <laughs> um, but I always, I always hate it. As a student of history, I always hate it when you had to say, well, in the year 1332, there was the plague. You know, something like that. We, you know, you don't want to read back too long to, to look at for things. Um, but again, you know, this issue of information, media, silos, safe spaces on campuses, it does pain me when I look at, you know, uh, kids sort of being protected from a lot of, of this, um, this going on and election results that they didn't really agree with. What about that? Are they being coddled, or should they have safe spaces? Charlie, you're on a university campus. 
So, uh, as usual, I want to try to complexify this. So I think, <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think I was doing trigger warnings before I knew that they were trigger warnings. So, like before we, I teach bioethics, and so before we started even on abortion, I'd say it's likely someone in this class has either had an abortion or knows someone that did. If you if you find this problematic, come talk to me. Uh, we start abortion next week. Boom, yada yada. That's some other thing. But that's what I think we would call today a trigger warning. Now the problem, it seems to me, that when the coddling comes in is we say, we're going to leave out certain arguments that we're going to discuss in my class because you can't handle them. Uh, uh, or there are certain places on campus where we just won't deal with issue X, Y, or Z. Or we won't allow certain speakers to talk about issues X, Y, or Z. Those kinds of, I, I'm all for trigger warnings, all for people putting themselves and others in a position where they can address the issues effectively given what's out there. However, I'm not for, and I think it's, it's an anti-intellectual, anti-academic to say, there are certain arguments, there are certain topics we're just not going to talk about. Because that's settled and we're going to offend some people. And unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of the second kind. I'm all for the first kind. I think we need those to allow people uh, to actually engage in, in academic discussion. Uh, but it's the engagement in the arguments um, and, and the most contentious arguments in allowing a, plur a genuine pl plurality of views to be expressed in the classroom is necessary to me. Let me say just a couple things quickly. Um, I, I had a conversation uh, with, with both um, our D Vice President for Student Affairs and uh, the chaplain um, a couple of weeks ago after, after the election when our campus was talking about, you know, whether we wanted to be a you know safe space or you know sanctuary and all this stuff and how do we talk to people who are very upset and so on. I said, you know, are you getting together the kids who are Trump voters to talk with them? They're part of our community too. And a chaplain to her credit said, Yes, we really have to do that. Would you want to participate? And I said, sure, but I haven't heard from her yet. I think there is some truth to the to the to the point in the question um, that uh, you know, that, that, that the immediate reaction on many campuses has been to sort of um, uh, respond in a way that um, looks after some of the students, but not a, after all of the students. Um, that having been said, um, I think this is a case, and, and as, a, as a former journalist and a present, you know, sort of faux journalist, <laughs> um, you know, nonetheless, I, I think one always has to be a little careful about accepting the, the stories about, you know, the degree to which college and university campuses are, uh, you know, somehow totally politically correct, wall-to-wall -wall phenomena. Certainly on our campus, it's not, the, it's not the case. What one gets is some of that stuff which everybody recognizes, but a lot of open discussion among students and faculty. These are much more diverse places uh, than one might think. Let me just say one final thing. I just published an article in, in Smithsonian Magazine, which, which brought me into close contact with the election of 1800 between Adams and Jefferson. And, and I think actually some revisionism is due. Uh, that was not as bad as this one. Uh, it really wasn't. The press wasn't, the press was worse. The media was, in terms of the, the media hey. environment, uh, than, than, than in the early republic. And the kind, and, and I mean this actually seriously, in terms of calls for one of the candidates to be put in prison, um, in terms of the kinds of vituperation, and, and 1800 was ugly, no question about it. And with the Alien and Sedition Acts and so on, and calls to calling uh, Jefferson an atheist and you know apologists for the French Revolution, it was ugly. But I think I would go up in a historical argument. Uh, and say, actually, we've been something for the first time in American history, which is worse. And Mark covered that uh, 1800 election. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a hell of a ball. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go to something uh, a little less controversial, the issue of abortion, um, <laughs> which uh, two people wrote about, two people uh, asked a question about, and I think it's, it was a, a Catholic context, and this is obviously a, a fundamentally existentially serious issue for so many people, the Catholics in particular. Um, one question I'll, I'll sum up here. Uh, I want to understand, I want to understand people. 
for whom the candidate's position on abortion was the litmus test. How do you reconcile the pro-life position with the Paul Ryan approach, which would undermine social justice slash entitlement programs? And Charlie, I think I'll throw it to you first. You can all comment. You know, it's the abortion issue for so many people really, I think, summarizes, epitomizes the spot we're in where, you know, I've now been covering religion and politics for a long time. You saw so many people who loathe Donald Trump but would vote for him and did vote for him because of Supreme Court picks and Roe v. Wade and the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade made that kind of a calculus. You know, how should we look at that? How did that calculus, that moral slash political calculus strike you, Charlie? And then you, Marianne, I'd like to hear from you. Well, we all paid attention to this. We probably all heard different things. I'm interested to know what other panelists think. I had some frustrating interactions with pro-life organizations that were never Trump to start. And then once the general election came around, suddenly they were supporting Donald Trump. And what I like to call pro-life movement 2.0, I think, was dramatically hurt by this because we've spent a lot of time trying to tell anybody who would listen that the idea that, you know, we're a bunch of misogynistic men who want to control women's bodies, that's not who we are. Now our opponents can point to a leader that makes it difficult for us to make that claim. But just to get into the mindset of somebody, which I guess was the point of the question, I don't know, imagine that there's 4,000 five-year-olds who were killed today, often because they were just inconvenient. And it happens every day. A colleague of mine said, when I taught high school, before I got my Ph.D., he said his reaction to this was, you know, I'm pretty much a Democrat, but let's let the killing stop first. And that was his approach. So if you want to just get in the mindset of somebody, and I got lots of nasty stuff said about me for continuing to be never Trump throughout all this. Their points were, you know, you're going to put somebody in the office who will ensconce this in the Supreme Court as a constitutional right. We'll never get it back. We'll never get a chance to get it back. And I have a grudging respect for that. I actually didn't think Donald Trump would actually do that at the end of the day. I think he's probably pro-choice. But that's my own judgment of what went on in that election. But I understand, I can perfectly understand why someone would say, let the killing stop first, and then we'll worry about the other stuff. I think one of the difficult things is we all have different hot-button issues. For the bishops, as far as I could figure, the hot-button issues were sanctity of marriage and abortion. And I certainly respect that. Maybe those weren't your hot-button issues. My hot-button issue is gun violence, and for good reason. You know, I lived in Newtown. I worked on the recovery efforts. My dear friend lost her granddaughter. My daughter, the little girl, Caroline, that she coached in swimming. You know, six minutes, one gunman, 26 people. Noah Posner had a little twin sister, first grader. She made it. He didn't. His father said he had 11 bullets in him. The principal's daughter said the bullets in her mother went in like a pencil eraser and out like a softball. We do not need weapons of war in our neighborhoods, on our streets. We need to deal with gun violence, and we need to deal with it now. One final question, because uh, I've got to wrap it up here in these next couple of minutes. I'd like you all to perhaps to respond to, and this, this is a question uh, that's, which uh, is played up in a number of the queries here. Just one says, I sense an increased optimism since the election. 
what is this attributed to, in your opinion? And I think um, that gets to the uh, issue of the normalization of Donald Trump or not, which I think fundamentally gets to our issue of common ground. Here's a very disruptive candidate, whatever you, you supported him or not, if you supported him, you wanted him to, to be disruptive. Um, here's an unusual guy. You've got you know, Barack Obama advising him, you know, trying to give him pointers on you know, uh, where you make coffee in the, in the West Wing kind of thing, um, and how to basically how to be president. But again, Mark Silk, you brought up the issue of Germany 1933. Not that he's Hitler, but um, you know, there is is what if you don't accept him as the legitimate president, whatever you think about the popular vote, um, you know, is that going to further polarize the country, further divide the country, drive us? away from what precious little common ground and common good there is. But on the other hand, if he's truly a dangerous person, like the Catholic Center Party, do you, what risks do you take in normalizing him? Or if not normalizing him, normalizing even his behavior? What is the approach that we take? Well, I mean, for what it's worth, my own view is that you know some of this talk about normalization is, is I mean, I don't, I don't see it. I don't, you know, unless uh, the recounts turn out differently, or unless some rogue electors choose differently, he's the legitimately elected president of the United States. Uh, and uh, and until he does something, you know, impeachable, that's what he's going to, you know, that's what's going to be the case. So, I mean, in that sense, I think, you know, everybody. You know, one should treat him that way, but that doesn't mean, you know, allowing stuff to go by that you wouldn't otherwise allow. It doesn't mean going along for the sake of compromise with things that you don't think ought to be compromised on. I, you know, I think that the, I, I mean, I'm not a great fan of uh, of gridlock per se. Um, just as I'm, you know, not a great fan of people fighting each other over polarized issues all the, all the time, but if that needs to be done, I mean, if 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 the if the Senate needs if the Senate Democrats need to hold up legislation uh, to stop repeal of you know, or privatization of Medicare, they should go do it. Mm -hmm. I mean that, and and we should support them. I mean, from my standpoint, there may be you know disagreements, but. But I think one tries to carry on in a way that's serious about the issues that one cares about. Tom, what do you think? Well, um, you know, in many ways, I guess I've sort of shared, I guess, my overall view on it, which is that I am optimistic. I would say I am optimistic for a variety of reasons. Among them, I have great faith in Americans and the country. Um, because I don't think, you know, I, my brother and my father, both Marines, my brother fought in Gulf War I, my father fought a long time ago. I, I was not a Marine, I didn't fight <coughs> in any war, um, but there's been a lot of rhetoric, so just take it for what it is. Some of what I'm about to say, I don't even know if it's true or if it even happened, okay? But when I heard some of the things, the Muslim comment some time ago, um, temporary ban on Muslims. Like I had a, a moment of like, those are the kinds of things I would fight for because it's in my DNA to believe those things as American. Like that's how I was raised. That's how I think. Um, and I think a lot of people share those kinds of feelings. Um, to me, that's just an example of why I am confident in the way we sort of our view towards life as Americans. Um, you know, I think when they start talking about things like normalizing and whatnot, no offense to those in the, I'm kind of in the, the media business myself. It's when media people don't have anything else to talk about. It's when they're all copying each other, when they make up some term and Brexit, all of a sudden Brexit, 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 you know, for, for days all we hear about is Brexit. I'm like, that is the dumbest word I've ever heard. <laughs> what actually is going on here? <coughs> Normalization is sort of a, a word right now about, oh, we're normalizing Donald Trump and we're doing, I just think like when the rubber hits the road, these things never happen. You ever notice, you know, with the oil, you know, 
so and so said such and such, and, you know, this guy in Saudi Arabia is mad at that guy in Iran, the oil prices went up. This has been going on my whole life. Nothing ever happens, actually. Just the oil price goes up because we all freak out when, when little things happen. And I think a lot of it is the way we sort of tell each other stories. I think we're, we're seeing so much of that, you know, right now, is that we're, we want to tell a bunch of stories and get all freaked out about what's going to happen one way or another. And then tomorrow we all get up and go to work and do our thing and Congress happens and the whole stuff keeps happening. So um, I don't think it's crazy to feel optimistic. I think it actually makes a lot of sense to feel optimistic. But I would have said the same thing the day after Barack Obama got elected too. I would. I didn't vote for Barack Obama. I woke up the next morning and thought, all right, this is what we're going to do now. Let's, let's have at it. This will be interesting too. Um, and I don't mean to... I'm mostly right. Like, we kind of have gotten this right, right? Do you, you really look at our country and say, oh, this sucks? Have you seen the food? Have you seen all the stuff we have in this country and the freedoms we have in this country? It's pretty great. You know, you, look, look, one other thing. We live in a town where every, many people in this town know everything about finance. Well, what happened in 07 and 08? Because they lost all the money, too, right? We know where they were betting. They were betting with the rest of us idiots. But we all got it wrong. The, the experts, too. Then we have the election. All these fancy, smart people that we all live around. They were so wrong. I dropped my kid off at basketball practice at 7.30. He said, Trump's up by a little bit. I said, by the time you get back in the car, Hillary Clinton's going to be president. <laughs> I mean, what an idiot I am. Um, we're all idiots. Like it's, we always react to the stupidest things, and in the end, like it kind of normalizes. So I don't think it's crazy to, to, to be optimistic. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And he, you know, I've never felt so good about being called an idiot. I think that's what he's doing. <laughs> to end the evening. Thank you to Charlie Camosi from Fordham, Mark Silver. I've gotten a couple of phone calls. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Let me give a couple of little examples of why. I see two kids sitting next to each other. And they're typing away on their telephone. They're texting each other. <laughs> They're right next to each other. They can talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. That bothers me. Because they don't know how to communicate. They're not listening. They're talking at each other. I have a young couple come in. They want to get married. And I tell them one of the most important things they have to do is not talk to each other, but listen to each other. Because 99% of the time the problems get raised are not the thing that's being presented, and you have to learn how to listen underneath to what the real problem is. That means getting to know somebody, and talking to them, and listening to them, and feeling with them. And there's a book I read every once in a while. And there's a politician, and he's talking to a religious person, and he says, what is truth? And that question is still being asked. So why are we doing this? I think because we want our children to talk to each other. We want us to talk to each other and not at each other. And we want to come to know somehow what God's truth is all about. So don't leave right away, and don't complain, but talk to each other. The whole purpose is to get you to look at some of the issues. It's not about politics, it's about people. Thank you.